Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. Today I want to talk about this cat. Not only can it open all the doors in my apartment, but it can also open my fridge. So if you have any unsealed meat into the fridge, be sure that the cat will find it and will take care of it. And I wanted to find some kind of method to scare the cat away from, from the fridge. So some kind of cat repeller. So it stops eating my meat. So let's have a look at the different repelling technique. First, I found out that the cat doesn't like the sound produced by this. This is an ultrasonic bath cleaner. And this is from Emag the ME5. It was just the one which I, which I had. And if we look at the package, we see here that it, it produces 50 watt at 9, 49 kilohertz. So this we cannot hear at 50 watts at this frequency is really really loud and probably the cat can hear this frequency we can't and because it's so loud the cat is just afraid of it so that, that would be my guess test number one the ultrasonic bath Then we have this device, which you can plug uh, into into the wall. This is normally a pest repeller, electro electromagnetic. I don't know what's magnetic on there. Um, normally for rats or for mosquitoes, but the the cat seems also to to avoid it. If we look at the back, put voltage 240 volts, and then the power input is less than two watts. But what's interesting is here the audio output. Uh, it's between 20 and 65 kilohertz. That's a very broad range, and they don't say how loud it is. But what do you expect? It was really a cheap device which I wanted to try. What's funny is this. Look at this. This is particularly short. So it doesn't even fit inside. It doesn't hold it in. And it cannot work. So the, the, yeah, it's really badly designed. To use it, I need to use a travel adapter. And then I can plug a travel adapter which has the right size into the plug. Up. And if we switch it on, it should produce some noise, and this LED fades in and out. <clears throat> Test number two, the cat repeller. Doesn't do anything, it seems. She doesn't like it, but yeah, she doesn't like it. Because there's no transformer here, this device is not floating, meaning that the ground is not isolated from the mains. And that's the reason why I will not connect it to my uh, oscilloscope, because this ground lead used as reference is connected to Earth. And the, you could use the two probes of the oscilloscope and then differentiate it in math. But at these high frequencies, it probably won't give any good results. And also at these high voltages, because one of them will be at a high voltage compared to Earth. So we will just say that this device uh, either has a fixed frequency between 20 and 65 kilohertz, or it is sweeping from 20 to 65 kilohertz, and that's why um, they provide this range. And this is the last device. Uh, it normally is a dog trainer, the 
Oakman sensor AD100. It's not really a sensor because it's sending things. Uh, it has three modes, either on the front, which is then just the light, uh, in the middle, which is light plus some kind of sound, but uh, not very loud sound. You generally reward your dog. And then in the end, when you want to uh, push your dog, uh, to punish your dog, or to make him afraid, then you use the, the second one. This is probably a louder sound, but we'll have a look inside. And it's just powered by a 9 volt battery. Test number three, the dog trainer. Yeah, this is a bit loud. This she doesn't really like. And this is the inside <coughs> of this dog trainer. Again, we don't have a lot of components. Here we have this quick component. Here we have a potentiometer. Probably this is to set the frequency, but uh, I'll test it out later. Now it's glued. Here we have just one IC. It's an STHFC4069UBE. And this is actually a hex inverter. It's not just kind of a timer or something like that, it's a hex inverter. I don't really know why they used it. And here is a transformator. I think they use it to amplify the voltage. Here we don't have a piezoelectric element as we had on the other repeller. We have a speaker. Uh, probably this is also a speaker which is used for ultra, uh, ultrasounds. And that's that's pretty much it. Let's measure what's coming to the to the speaker. Because this device uses a battery, all voltages are floating, meaning I can connect any point to the ground of the oscilloscope and the ground of the oscilloscope is directly connected to earth. On the other devices I couldn't do it because one uh, it wasn't floating, meaning some components were connected somehow directly to one of the two AC inputs and connected into to earth would create a short but here i can do and can do it safely and i've connected the channel one of the oscilloscope to the microphone the ultrasonic well, my, no not microphone the ultrasonic speaker of this device and we'll see what it does so in the first mode it just provides light and as you can see there's nothing on the oscilloscope if we go to the second mode we see it provides up, let's go range the right way. It provides around 5, 4.5 volts peak to peak of a signal, and it's it is an approachment of a sinusoidal signal. It is not very clean anything because they're using just uh, discrete components like this. They cannot provide a very good smooth signal, but <clears throat> it's around uh, 4 volts peak to peak, and it's at 23.9 kilohertz. But this is what you see here, and you can also see it on the top, 23.9. What's funny is that we, if we move it a bit, or if we press too long on it, if we wiggle on it, you can already see that it changes, it changes something in the circuit, just by a bit rotating. So it's it is not very stable. And then in the last mode, we see it's a lot bigger, and here we have. 25 volts peak to peak at a frequency of 26 kilohertz and I think it uses this transformer to get at this voltage and because it's a pretty smooth um, sinusoidal wave uh, it probably uses an, uh, a separate circuit and not the same circuit to, to go through this transformer and then to be amplified at 26, 26 volts. Now let's find out what this trim pot does. For that I will just use a screwdriver to be able to turn it. Let's switch it on in the normal mode. And if I turn it, I expect to change the frequency, but we'll see rapidly. Oh, okay, so it doesn't change the frequency, but it changes the amplitude. And actually I can have a way cleaner signal, which is now 6 volts peak to peak. Although it seems to be more uh, triangle form, I think it's 
it's quite cleaner. Let's see if it changes it on the other. Oh yes, it also changed the other. Now the other one is not looking very good. Change back. Now we have this. Okay, so it does influence the two, the two, the two values, and they seem to have the the same circuits to generate this frequency, and it generates it changes the amplitude and the cleanliness of these two things. So, yeah. But the most important thing is that it's uh, around twenty twenty three kilohertz, twenty four kilohertz. Yeah, 25 kilohertz at this frequency range and it is 20 volts on this small ultrasonic speaker this is quite light or loud now i know why the cat and dogs don't don't like this sound we cannot hear it because it's um, beyond our uh, beyond what humans here can can hear so now why do these devices use these frequencies We've seen the wall plug mount uses one frequency between 20 kilohertz and 65 kilohertz, but we couldn't figure out which one. And the handheld dog trainer uses frequency of 25 kilohertz. And I was interested to know why this specific frequency. First, let's have a look at the hearing range of the different mammals. And this is a picture I got from Wikipedia. If we look at the humans, so on the X axis, you have the frequency. And on the y-axis, you have the different mammals. And here it shows which are the hearing frequencies. And in purple, we have the humans, which have a hearing frequency of between 31 hertz and 19 kilohertz. Generally, what's most commonly known is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. It's easy to remember. And at the borders, it's not really defined what is the the precise frequency. So just remember between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. And here, if we look at cats, we already see it has more uh, a wider range on the higher frequencies. So it can hear between 55 hertz and 77 kilohertz. So it hears higher frequency, and this is probably what we call the ultrasound. So ultrasounds, I'll define it as everything which is above. 20 kilohertz and which human cannot really hear. This picture shows only the frequency range which we can hear, but obviously we don't hear all the frequency the same way and with the same amplitude. And so we wanted to know in a bit more details what we can hear. So I looked around at scientific publications and I've landed on this paper, The Evolution of Human Hearing. And as you can see, it's already from, from 69. It's, it's pretty old, but I mean, it's not too old neither. We, we humans have existed for a long time and it would be interesting to know what we can hear. So if we go to page six, we have this diagram here and we have the different curves. So again, on the X axis, we have the frequencies, it goes up to 65 kilohertz. And on the Y axis, we have the sound pressure level, which you can see here. So sound pressure level is open, often abbreviated in SPL and given in decibels. So this is a decibel lock scale. Um, here we can see that we have the humans, the man, in M, and then these are other species. We have O is the opossum, and then other animals. So we can see we can hear around pretty well around 20, uh, 200 hertz. So this is 200 hertz up to here. Here it's really, really decreasing. Up around 16 kilohertz, like here is probably 20. Um, 20 kilohertz, so we can see up above 20 kilohertz, we, we hear pretty badly and it has to be loud so for us to perceive. And the other mammals, the other animals, as you can see, can hear better in the higher frequency than humans can. We can apparently hear better in the lower frequencies, but they hear better in the higher frequency in the ultrasonics. So this is for man or humans in general. And this is 
an estimate. So don't take those numbers very precisely. It really depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the age um, which the man has. It depends on on his body construction, on in, on its weight, uh, on on where it comes from, and so on. So and also it it depends on how you measure it. So it, this paper describe how it measures, but other papers have other ways to measure the human hearing. So this is really to give to give an estimate and not precise numbers. And all the other graphs will give estimates and not precise numbers. So when you tell the free, then humans here between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, well, that's that's an estimation because when we get old, we don't hear that well the higher frequencies. It changes with the age. Now let's look for cats. And for cats, I've come to um, a journal which is called Hearing Research. Um, hearing Research, as the name implies, has a lot of papers about um, about hearing, and I found a lot also for cats. So this is the temporal iteration of pure tones in the in the cat, and this is from ninety two. I wasn't even born at at that time. Um, and if you look, so it it uses pure tones, and then it measures if the cat can hear it or not. This is the result which they came on on page four. Again, here we have the sound pressure level, he abbreviated SPL, and it's in, in decibel, so it's a log scale. Uh, again, we can hear that the cat hears badly at lower frequencies, which are around here, but we don't know what it hears at higher frequencies. So we know it hears pretty well between one kilohertz and 16 kilohertz, but this is also true for, for man. So it shows you the hearing and they used four cats. I mean, four cats is not a huge, um, it's not a huge sample. They just took four Felis catus. This is the Latin name, domestic cats, as we know it better. And they measured it. But here they measure it more in the human hearing range. There was another paper in 1985. I still wasn't born in 85, about hearing the hearing range of domestic cats. And if we go to page three, we will see um, it uses a broader hearing range. It starts around 50, 40 hertz and it goes up to 91 kilohertz. The range is a lot broader. Here again, we see that between one and around 20, it hears pretty well, like humans do, humans do, but then above 20, it still can hear something up until, let's say, 48 kilohertz. Um, yeah, so we know that cats can hear pretty well also above 20 kilohertz, so the ultrasonic frequencies. But then why? Why do we use this specific frequency of 23 kilohertz or 25 kilohertz and so on? Uh, I don't really know. And there was even um, a study about the efficiency of an ultrasonic cat deterrent. This is from 2006, so it's not too old. And if we look at page three, we see it, it, it evaluated the cat watch cat repellent. And this uses a frequency between 21 and 23 kilohertz. I didn't find any other study about ultrasonic cat repellents. That's the only one I found. So they use this frequency and it somehow works. It doesn't work all the time. The cats need a bit of training, but it, it works. Still, the paper doesn't explain the, why they use this frequency and not another frequency. Um, maybe it has to do something with because the humans cannot hear it and the cat can, can hear it. I don't really, I don't really know. I can just guess. Also, if you look for other cat repellents, you will always see that they use something around 23 kilohertz to to repel the cats. They have some patterns, and then you find products on Amazon or other marketplaces. But 
I didn't figure out in this hearing ranges, which we've seen why exactly 23 kilohertz, because there's, there's no specific thing at 20, 23 kilohertz. So I thought maybe it has to something to do with psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics are sound which trigger some kind of psychological effect. Uh, the best known example for humans, it's uh, scraping with fingernails on, on chalkboards, but also scraping with a fork on a dish. This makes our hair already straight, stand up straight. And it's not because of the sound itself, it's because apparently there's a psychological uh, trigger behind it. And um, it is supposed that it has something to do with how macaque monkeys used to warn and used to sound alarms and this has been installed in our brain. But that's one supposition and it's one possibility. At least these are psychoacoustic sounds, so sounds which trigger an effect which we don't really like, or in this case which we don't like. So psychoacoustics are things which um, create a psychological um, reflex and it's not really about how loud we perceive it. For cats, I didn't find any study. The only thing I found was this paper, an automated psychoacoustic testing apparatus for use in cats. This is from 2014. And this only describes the test setup itself, so the apparatus. It doesn't, this, it, they didn't yet do testings on cats. So we don't really know about the, about psychoacoustics on cats. And if this is already in 2014, I don't, uh, I, it doesn't explain why 23 kilohertz is something which is um, particularly relevant. And then um, while looking around, I also found an interesting um, publication called Use of Frightening Devices in Wildlife Damage Management. This is a bit long, it's 18 pages and they discuss about several methods, how to scare different wildlife animals. It's not only about um, sounds, they have lots of other methods, uh, infrareds, um, loud shockwaves and so on. And they have a very small part which talks about cats here. Studies have shown that cats have a very sensitive hearing, uh, sensitive hearing from minus 19 to minus one decibel sound pressure level in the range of one kilohertz to two kilohertz. And this is the frequency. And if you look at other papers about how they um, train cats or how they measure the efficiency of cats, they often use this one kilohertz or this two kilohertz tone to see what effect it has. There are other publications on that. But this, even this one doesn't explain why it's um, why it should be 23 kilohertz, specifically 23 kilohertz. So in the end, my guess is simply the sound repellents just try to have a very loud noise at uh, which scares cats and it has to be loud, but not hearable by, by humans. So if it will be always be very loud for humans, it will be annoying for us too. And it should only be annoying for cats. So my conclusion to that is that if you use any frequency above 20, about 20 kilohertz, which is very loud, it will annoy the cat and the cat will probably uh, try to avoid it. And for us, it would really annoy it because we don't perceive it. So yeah, just use, where is it again? And try to not go too high in the ultrasounds because as we can see, here it drops pretty fast also. So something between 20 kilohertz to 48 or 46 kilohertz seems a pretty nice range for trying to scare off a cat using ultrasounds at least, and it won't annoy the humans. To find out if the cat is in front of the fridge, I will use this device. This is a simple range detector, so whenever an object is in front of it, it, it will shine through, uh, it, will, it will activate. It's an E18, D50, and K, and it's pretty easy to operate. You just provide 
you have three pins. You just provide five volts between red and red is plus, uh, green is minus. And then on the signal, it will just tell you if something is in front of the sensor or not. And this sensor can, you can adjust the range of it where it will detect it between uh, three centimeters and 80 centimeters using the small trim pot here in the end. I'll demonstrate it. So now I've connected this inf this range detector to to power. Here we have plus five volt on the red lead, ground on the green lead, and a pull up resistor on the yellow lead. This is the output, but you still need to to put a pull up resistor. That's what you see here. And then this yellow cable goes to the multimeter, and we see the signal here. So when nothing is in front of the range detector, it will be at five volts. Then if you go near to it, then you then it goes to zero volts and a red LED is going on in, inside the range detector. And as you can see, it is quite precise. This is the sweet spot where it triggers and where it finds something in front of it. And if you want to, to change this range detection, then you just have to turn the trim pots on the back. And if you turn it clockwise, then you increase the distance. As we can see here, it's still detected and I have to put it's way apart now here. Now it's not detected anymore. And you can set the range between uh, 3 centimeters and 80 centimeters, something along that. What's pretty nice too is that um, it also, it's, it's, it's very narrow, so it's really in front of it. As you can see here, I trigger it, but so if I'm right in front of it, I trigger it, as you can see here, but when I go a bit left or right, I don't trigger it anymore. Now it's not triggered anymore. Now right in front it's triggered. Then we have the arm and here again it's not triggered. So because of this lens in the front, the, um, the light barrier which is created is a very narrow beam. And then this lens also uh, for on the receiver is makes it also very, very focused on exactly the, the, the thing in the front. So you can be sure that it's in line of sight. I don't know the the opening of this, the, the angle, there's still, there's still something of an angle, but I mean, even like this, it's, it really has to be in front to, to operate. So that, that's quite good because it creates a straight line light barrier. And how this device works is not too complicated. Actually, we see we have two lenses. It has something to do with light. And what you see behind here is some light shining from the device. If I take the power off, you see there is no light anymore. If I put it back, if I put the power back, there is light again. No light and light. Um, you, we cannot see it on the with the naked eye. We can only see it on the camera. This LED, which is uh, shining, so it's infrared light. This is simply to detect. So on the one side we have an infrared LED, which is going on and off, going through um, a, a lens, a plastic lens, and on the other side we have actually the receiver. So whenever there is something in front of it. The light which is emitted by the LED will be reflected by the object and will be received back by the by the receiver here. But because we don't want any other infrared light source to interfere, for example, if we would have an, an other powerful infrared light source somewhere which will go directly inside here, then it will be also detected as something in front of the object. And to avoid that, um, the trick is that this receiver will only trigger on the pattern which is emitted by this LED. So this LED is pulsed at a special frequency or using a special pattern. And the nebulizer, which is on the right side, is also tuned to this frequency or to this pattern. And if it receives exactly the same pattern, if the demodulator receives exactly the same pattern as the infrared LED is receiving, then it knows, okay, this is really something which is in front of my sensor. It's, and it's not only a simple um, LED source.
uh, light source or infrared light source. And if we can, here I have a phototransistor. This phototransistor simply goes on and off depending on the light shining on it. So the, the LED which is inside it is acting as the gate for this phototransistor. And if we look at the oscilloscope, and if I put it right off on front of it, you can see that it's really, um, you can see the, the, the pulse and the signal of this infrared LED. It's around 200 kilohertz. So a bit more. You can see here it's a bit, it's, it's around 200 kilohertz. So the demodulator, which is inside here, will only get, try to detect the signal which is at 200 kilohertz. And if there's a signal at 200 kilohertz, it means that the light from the LED is bounced back from the object in front of it. So there is an object in front of it. The problem I have with this range detector is that the LED is constantly, constantly on. So it constantly draws power. And as we can see here, um, when it's just standing there, it draws around 25 milliampères. And when it's something is in front of it, then you can add another 8 milliampères because of the red light which is going on. And if I want to have a battery, de pad battery operated device, Drawing constantly 25 milliampere is really a lot of energy and I need either huge batteries or I need to change them very often. And this 25 milliamperes depend on actually the range which you want to use. The demodulator is, is fixed, you cannot change a, a lot on top of it. And if you want to exchange the range, then it's pretty simple. You just add more power to the LED. So if I turn it on, I extend the range, you can see that the, this device draw more, draws more power. And this is simply how you extend the range, because the, the LED here will be brighter. Um, you, the, the reflection, the object which will reflect in front of it can be a bit further, and then the demodulator is fixed. Actually, let's see if we can see it on the camera. We dim it back. Up. So this is I dim on, and here I dim it. I turn it. Oh, this way normally should be turned back. Yeah. So this is now going slowly back, and you can see on the camera that the LED is fading slowly. So this is a problem. I have to find another alternative because I want to operate my end device with batteries and I cannot have an LED at 25 or 30 milliampere constantly on. Because I cannot operate it this all the time, since it uses so much power, I will use this module. This is a motion sensor, motion detector. It's an HCS. R501, uh, I think, and it's basically based on a passive infrared sensor, which is just there. So this is the passive infrared sensor. Then they put a Fresnel lens in front of it, so you have a, you can cover a wider range. This way, so you have a, it can detect any motion within 110 degrees. <clears throat> and on the back, you just provide power here with VCC and ground, and out will go high whenever motion is detected. We'll have a look at the oscilloscope, how it, how it works. So here I've connected 5 volts between VCC and ground, and the oscilloscope probe on the out pin, which is the signal, which is coming out of it. And in front we have the infrared sensor. Now if we look at the oscilloscope, I just leave it rest a bit. It is low when it when there is no movement, and when it detects movement, it then goes high. As you see here, here it goes high because of the uh, of the movement. If I just rest and move a bit, here is a movement, and you can see that after around two seconds, it goes low again. So whenever, even if the movement is short and I don't move. Uh, it has, it's up at least for 1.5 seconds. That's the minimum time it's up. 
And if I move all the time, here I move all the time, you see it doesn't go down at all. So the 1.5 second is the minimum after the last time it detected a movement. And yeah, after the last motion detection, it will remain 1.5 seconds high, then it will remain low. And it goes, then there's a mini time between the going low and going high, high again. There's also a minimum delay. These two things, the things you can change them here. I have two potentiometer. This potentiometer uh, sets the, the time which it's on after the last motion detection. This potentiometer just sets the sensitivity. So um, if you if it's at the lowest position, it will detect motion at around three meters. If it's at the highest position, it will detect motion at around seven meters. And it will be also more sensible at the borders because it's generally more sensible. Oh, now it's off. Let's put it, put it back on. And here the time, if I increase it, I can just increase it slightly and you, can, you will see that it changes the on time. So here it is increased slightly. Now there's motion. And as you can see, it already takes at least 3.4 seconds as it's showed here, even for a small detection. So you can measure from um, around 1.5 seconds to up to five minutes. So the signal can be on to up to five minutes if this is at the highest position. This is sensitivity. Now the fact that it always continues on if there's motion, this is set by this small connection here. There are two modes, which you hear MD stands for mode. There is the retriggerable mode and the non retriggerable mode. If you go in the H mode, so if you short the middle pin with the, the H here, you go in the retriggerable mode. And the retriggerable means that as long as there is motion, it will stay on and the, uh, it will continue the, this, this time delay, this minimum time uh, on signal. If you go on to, on to low, then it will only go on for this time. So the 1.5 seconds, for example, then it will go low again. It waits a minimal delay and then go, it can go high again. So this way the signal will be repeated on, on the oscilloscope and you will have a lot of um, edges going up. I won't, able, I won't be able to show it because I've just already soldered it on the on the H position, so the retrievable position. Now I want to use this module because as you can see in its idle mode, it only uses around 50 microampere. So that's not a lot. And when there is motion, it will use 330 microamperes. That's a lot less than the 30 milliamperes within for the infrared um, infrared range detector. So what I will do is that I will use this motion detector to see if there is motion. And once there is motion, I will switch on the LED for a short time. So the time which I will set here. And then for five or 10 seconds, this will be on and only then the 30 milliampere will be drawn. Because if there's no, no motion, there is no cat. And if there's no cat, there is no need to verify if the cat is in front of the fridge. Um, now we have the two most important components and I will hook them up and create the board with it and to have the whole system. Now I just need something to scare the cat and I have the choice between a speaker like this, but this needs a transformer so you can drive it pretty loudly and you have to provide a sinusoidal wave to, uh, for it to perform. Or a uh, piezo buzzer, a piezoelectric element like this. These are just two plates which vibrate. And what's particularly useful is that with that is you can drive them with a sinusoidal wave, but you don't have to. You can also drive them with um, square wave, like I see on the oscilloscope here. So the microcontroller here just toggles a pin on and off, and this produces this square this square wave. And if I now connect, as you can see here, it's at four kilohertz. And if I now connect to it, it's the brown and the orange cable. There's no polarity, so you can drive them and you can connect them in either way. You can see that 
it works quite well. It produces sound and produces a very loud sound. I didn't have to use any sort of transformer to increase the voltage. I just have 5 volts and still it is pretty loud. The disadvantage is that you cannot provide multiple frequencies at the same time, but it's not important. I just want to scare the cat, so I will use the piezo element. So let's talk about how piezoelectric um, sound components work. And for that, I will use this application manual from Murata. I found it simple and, and it gave me a lot of information. So we'll go through, quickly through it. So <clears throat> this is how a piezoelectric device um, transducer is built. You have two electrodes, which you can see here. In the middle of the two electrodes, you have a piezoelectric ceramic, and then the top of it is uh, glued on a metal plate. And the whole component is called piezoelectric diaphragm. And I'll call that diaphragm from, from now on. Now, if you want to produce a sound, it's very simple. First, you apply a voltage on the two electrodes and different voltage. So one side will contract and the other side will expand. And if you apply the reverse voltage on the other side, then the other side will contract and uh, the opposite side will expand. And this causes the piezoelectric ceramic to produce a sound. So you just have to provide an AC voltage or simply signals with switch on all the time polarity. And with that, you can, uh, up, uh, you, you can create sounds. So this is how the di this diaphragm uh, work. Now, to find out which frequency they produce is not that simple, actually. You can produce a lot of frequency, but the most important one is the resonant frequency, and this is where it will be the loudest. And as you can see, the he as you can see here, the resonant frequency depends simply how you attach the diaphragm to, to, to anything else, how, with, what the support is. If you attach it on the, on the ends or, just next to the piezoelectric ceramic plate or in the middle, that will change the resonant frequency. And if this is already not complicated enough, you have an additional component. It's when you use a cavity. And for that you use, um, I think it's written somewhere here, here, the Helmholtz formula. And using the Helmholtz Hemholtz formula, you will find out what is the resonant frequency of this cavity. And this cavity is quite crucial because it will allow you to be even louder at a specific frequency. And this is why most of the piezoelectric devices which you see have this cavity. They are tuned to a specific frequency and on this frequency they are very loud. It's not like a speaker which is loud at uh, all the frequency range almost continuously here they uh, depending on how you attach the diaphragm and on what cavity you use uh, you can have a resonant frequency at different you can have different fre resonant frequency and different loudness and this depends on the height here the the size of the hole the size of the supporting elements the size of the plates the thickness of the plates and so on so it's a whole science behind it not like you provide just a 2 kilohertz sine wave and it will produce a very loud frequency at 2 kilohertz. This has to be tuned. There are two types of diaphragm. There are the very simple ones with only two cables and here you have to drive it. So as we explained before, you have to apply voltage and the reverse voltage or any kind of different voltage so you can create an edge and a different contraction. And then you have this self-drive mode where you have some kind of feedback which allows you to, to tune to this frequency and to be, um, to be very light at this frequency. And generally, this is, this is the difference which you find between the different piezoelectric devices. Some are just two pins with the bare plates and you have to drive it using an oscillating frequency. And on some other ones which have the drive circuit integrated into the element, 
then you don't have to provide a oscillating frequency, you just have to provide a constant voltage and this circuit will make it very loud um, at this frequency. And the feedback for that is quite useful because it will tune to this, uh, to this resonant frequency and be very loud there. So this is very loud and very easy to drive, but you cannot set the, the frequency which you would like. This is why we will use this one because we don't want to just use a frequency which is given by the um, by the device, but we want to use a frequency which is a lot higher in the ultrasonic range. And yeah, another another important part is here you see that the freak resonant frequency plays a role and as you can see in the diagram with the same elements if you cross across go across the frequency from 0 kilohertz to 6 kilohertz you will see the sound pressure level in decibels is quite different it's not very linear this is why tuning is important and what's more important here what is what it shows is that the voltage which you apply will directly affect the sound. This is a logarithmic scale, but if you double the voltage, you will have 6 dB more sound. So it's more, if you double the, the voltage, it's more than twice as loud because twice as loud would be only 3 dBs. So it's four times as loud. Four times as loud is 6 dBs. This is why voltage is quite, uh, quite important. So if you want to be loud, just go at a uh, higher voltage. And uh, if you can, this is the voltage peak to peak. Uh, let's take as example. So TDK, uh, I just took a data sheet from one piezo electric element, which I showed you before, uh, piezo electronic buzzer from TDK. And here you see the different models. Here you see only one frequency and this is where they tune to. They tune so that the resonant frequency and the cavity is pretty loud at this frequency. And this is the loudness which you have. 70 dBA at 10 centimeters maximum at a peak to peak voltage from 3 volts. This is for example the element which I just had. And as you can see we can either drive it with a sine, sine wave as you can see here, or with a square wave, uh, with a square wave, and it's a lot simpler to drive it with a square wave. Um, sine waves are a bit better and they are louder. So you can see here, at around four kilohertz, which is here, you produce eighty dBs with a three volt RMS sine wave. Here, for four kilohertz with a three volt peak to peak, you only produce seventy dB. This is quite still very loud and we will use this this way and here again you can see that it's tuned to a particular frequency depending on how you drive it also you can see that the the, the volume at which it resonates is quite different depending on the frequency so this is tuned at 4 kilohertz and just before 5 kilohertz it, very, it will be very loud now we want to produce something at around 23, 25 kilohertz. And I have no idea how loud it is or how well it behaves. You see it's fluctuating a lot. It has at least 60 dB for, for this frequency, except in, the, in this pit. But it's, this measurement stops at 10 kilohertz. We have no idea what goes beyond 10 kilohertz and how it behaves. I also don't know, but I will still drive it at more than 10 kilohertz, even more than 20 kilohertz. Now, here we've seen that the element is 12.2 millimeters wide and it's 0 0.5 mm, oh no, here, 6.5 millimeter high. If we take the same wideness, 12.2, and just change the height at 3.5, we already see a complete different uh, pattern around this range. Here now at, it's tuned to 5 kilohertz, it's pretty loud, and it's at 75 dB. Uh, also around that, but as you can see, the pattern is quite different. So the cavity changes a lot uh, on what sound is produced. This is with 12.2 with of uh, diameter, millimeter of diameter.
Now, if we go at 40 millimeter diameter, you can all also see that it's, um, it's a bit louder. Previously, we started at 60 dB and 70 dB. Now we're at 70 and 80 dB. And the, the, the peak at 4 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz are also for 3 volt square wave around 80 dBs, just because the plate is bigger. So it gives you, so the, the rough measurement, the rough idea is that the bigger the plate is, the louder it is. And then what I wanted to show you last is here, this. Here we don't have any cavity at all. And it's pretty hard to figure out what it does because it really depends on how you mount it. The mounting point will um, set the frequency range. So on a lot of data sheets, you will find this piezo element with the measurements, but they won't show you this pattern over the frequency because it doesn't make a lot of sense. It really depends on how you mount it and what cavity you will use. And as you can see here, it's not very loud. So this is pretty, pretty uh, pro, uh, wide. It's 15 millimeters of diameter and with 15 millimeters of diameter, you just go the 80 dB because it doesn't have any cavity, which just increases the sound for, for this frequency. So to drive this piezoelectronic buzzer, you simply need to provide a square wave. This is easy to do with a microcontroller because you just have to use one of the GPIO pins, general purpose input output pins, and switch it on and off at a specific fre frequency. What's even better is that most microcontrollers offer you a so-called PVM, so that's a pulse width modulation. This does exactly that. You just have to tweak one of the timers and it will produce a pulse width modulated signal at a frequency which you set. So you don't even have to do it in software. It will be done in hardware by the microcontroller. Here I've set it at 4 kHz with a duty cycle of 50%. Most piezoelectronic uh, buzzers are the loudest at uh, with a duty cycle of 50%. This is not true for all of these piezoelectric buzzers and not for all the frequencies. Most of the frequencies are the loudest at 50%, but sometimes, for example, at 2 kHz, it might be that 25% gives you a louder noise. But most of the time it's 50%. And then if you change this 50%, meaning if you increase or decrease the the duty cycle, you will decrease the volume. So somehow you can set the volume just by changing the duty cycle of this pulse width modulated signal. So here we have the pulse width modulated signal with a voltage of 4.7 or 4.6 volt peaks to peak. If I connect it, we can hear it is already loud at four kilohertz. But what's interesting is that it's not the loudness is the same if I connect one pin to the signal and the other to ground, or if I connect one pin to the signal and the other to five volt. It's exactly the same loudness. And this is because the important part on the square wave is actually this, uh, this transition. This causes to crow, this causes the sound to create. So a trick to be even louder, a free trick to be even louder on microcontrollers is just to increase this, um, this, this, this edge. Because the microcontroller only operates at four volts, you can use a second pin, which you can see here. We have the second pin connected and it generates exactly the same pulse width modulated almost the same pulse width modulated, so at four kilohertz. But what's interesting is here, it's inverted. Whenever this is low, this is high. So now you connect one pin here, the other pin here, and you don't only have a voltage peak to peak of five volts, but of 10 volts. And this makes it even louder, so. This is only with ground. Now, if I connect the two PVM signals, you see, it is a lot louder. This is twice as uh, the, twi the voltage 
is twice as high, meaning it's at almost four times as loud. It's not that precise because we don't hear the same loudness at different frequencies, but simply using a second pin by inverting the signal, which is generally offered by the hardware PVM, you can make it a lot louder. And this is hopefully loud enough for the cat to be scared. Here it generated at 4 kHz, but we will generate it at 23 or 24 kHz to scare the cat and not be annoying for me because as you could hear at 4 kHz it was really loud and I don't want to, to hear this beeping all the time. I want to annoy the cat, not myself. While you're at it, you can use the occasion to make a funny little experiment. I've told you that the human here can hear between 20 Hz and 20 kHz. This is a rough estimate. It depends on every people. It also depends on the volume and so on. But this is a rough estimate. Now, this changes between humans, but most importantly, it changes over time. When you're younger, you can hear higher frequency better. And as you grow older, you cannot hear these high frequencies anymore. So here we've produced 4 Hertz. Almost everyone can hear 4 Hertz. But as we will go higher in the frequencies, you will, they will diminish. The volume will be lower. Not only because uh, the volume produced here will be lower, but also because the, he the ear of the human will not hear it the same way. And at some point, you will stop hearing. And when you grow older, around 14 or 12 kilohertz, you won't hear anything anymore. And younger people, less than eight years old, will hear it until 20 or 18 kilohertz. So here we are connect it and then we will go through the frequencies and you can test yourself how high you can hear. This is at 4 kilohertz and I will just increase it all the time. This is what I came with too. So here we have a microcontroller. It's an Atmel 8032.8p. Um, uh, the development board is an Arduino Nano. It's connected to USB to provide power. And I'll provide the source code in the Git repository. Connected on that, we have first this Piezo Electronic or Electric diaphragm. I use the biggest one which I have. So. It, it doesn't have any cavity yet, so it won't be as loud, but as soon as I mount it on some support, it will be a bit louder. And I've used the, the biggest one which I have from actually the um, mains mouse and mosquito repeller, which you saw in the beginning. Then we have here the motion detector to find out if the cat is going in front of the fridge or not, or is, is moving around in this area. Here we have the range detector to find out if the cat is in front of the fridge. And this is a switch to know if the fridge is open or not. So whenever the fridge is open, you hear this small beep. Let me hold it so it will be louder. And then there's an alarm sounding to tell, okay, the fridge is open, please close it. And the alarm will go on uh, until the fridge is closed. Here it beeps every three seconds, but in real, I will set it to every 30 seconds, so it's not too annoying. And it's not very loud because it doesn't have any cavity. Now let's close the fridge again. The fridge is closed. And in normal mode, oh, fridge is closed. And in normal mode, it first detects if the cat is in the neighborhood. If the cat is in the neighborhood, the motion detector will warn it. And here will, you will see a blue LED going on. So the motion detector find out, okay, the cat is in the neighborhood. Now it switches on also this range detector. Because it draws a lot of power, I only switch it on if the cat is in front of the, is in the vicinity. 
and if the cat goes in front of the fridge, it will be in front of the range detector. And then I play an annoying sound. So here you can hear it, but in real I will have it in the ultrasonic frequency, so above 20 kilohertz. For the demo I removed 20 kilohertz, so you can hear it. But the same sound, if you had 20 kilohertz, you will go in the ultrasound, and this is what will be played and will be, I hope, loud enough once I mount it. And if the fridge is open while the cat was in front of it, it will beep this alarm continuously. And this is a human hearable alarm, so I know, okay, the cat opened the fridge and I have to close it and not leave it for forever. Yeah, so this is the basic setup and I will put everything in a box and in front of the fridge. Now I want to operate this circuit with the battery, so it's important to know how much power it draws so we, we know how long it can last with the battery. Here I provide 5 volt on this input port and you can see how much current is drawn here. And in resting mode, when it's idling, it's around 12.6 milliamperes, so it's not a lot. Whenever there is, uh, and I save a lot of energy because this is not always on. I wait a signal from the motion detector before I activate this. If the motion detector is on, you see it already goes at 30, uh, 35 milliamperes. So there are 20 milliamperes just drawn for this. Now, if there is an object in the front, then it uh, draws an additional 10 milliampere for this signal and also for the piezo, which is uh, sending a signal. Now it's in ultrasound, so you cannot hear it. If I let the alarm on, then the, both of them are switched off and you can see that only this piezo doesn't draw a lot of power. Normally we are at 12.6 milliampere, now we are at 14.2 milliampere. So that's 1.6 milliampere just for the piezo, which is really loud. So this is something good. What draws a lot of energy is this. <clears throat> but since we only want to activate it when there is motion, it shouldn't be too frequent. So that's still okay. Let's see if we can draw even less power. So let's close the fridge. So we know at, at resting, when, it, when the microcontroller is idling, it's around 13 milliamperes. Now I've changed a bit the code of the microcontroller and not, now it's not only idling, but it goes into a sleep power down mode. Um, the, everything is still activated and it's still powered on, but you see instead of 16 milliamperes, I only draw uh, 13 milliamperes, I only draw 4.7 milliamperes. So we already save uh, 8 milliamperes just by putting it into sleep. And this still works, see? If there is motion, then the infrared is activated, we see, again, that this still works. But when it's resting, it just draws 5 milliamperes. Now we are down to 3.6 milliamperes, and I saved this 1 milliampere just by removing the small LED which was here. This red LED which you've seen previously indicates if there is power or not, and it's constantly on. And LEDs consume not too much power, so I've unsoldered this small LED, and with that I saved one milliampere. And the system is still working, if there is motion I still have the LED which is on to tell me I have a motion texture, and the rest also works. And when it's powered on, we consume around 47 milliamperes. And to power this device, I will use batteries, because near the fridge there is no wall plug, which I could get energy from, so I need to, to use batteries, and then I can place it anywhere. So here I found just a case for three AAA batteries. These are rechargeable ones, so they deliver around 1.2 volts, and the three of them will provide uh, th 3 to 6 volts, so that's not enough to provide this, because this requires at least 5 volts, this requires exactly 5 volts. So for that I will use this small module. This is a boost converter, which takes something uh, down to 0 0.9 volts and will provide 5 volts on this USB. So if I connect, if I connect it, here you can see just resting, doing nothing, it draws 
four milliamperes. That's not enough, but well, it, it, it is some kind of circuit, so it, it had, has to draw something. Then I will just change USB converter, plug it in, and here we have the setup. So right now uh, on the board it's it's providing 4.7 volts and not 5 volts but that, that's also okay. And it's drawing 88 milliamperes and this is why this blue LED is on so it detected motion and this is on. Let's wait a bit until the motion has calmed down. So now the, uh, the motion has not been detected anymore and you see the power went a bit higher because it draws less less current. When there is no motion, the whole setup will use 15, 16 milliamperes from the batteries. Since the batteries are at provide 900 milliamperes hour, if we divide it by 16, it's around, um, let's say 60, 60 hours. So I have 60 hours, maximum 60 hours of battery operation. That's 60 hours, that's eight and a half days. So if nothing is happening for eight and a half days, this circuit will work, then I will have to recharge these batteries. And then if there is some motion, you see it draws 88 milliamperes. And if I put something in front, it even draws more. Oh, 300 milliamperes, that's, that's 250 milliamperes. Yeah, so the, and here you can see the, the corner, it goes down to 4.8 volt. This is because they cannot provide so much batteries. They have an internal resistance. These are small ones. But, um, and probably also because of this converter. But as you can see, it works. So now I can mount everything in a box and put it in front of the fridge. And this is the final setup. I put everything in a box near the fridge. So on the bottom, we have the infrared motion uh, motion sensor, the peer motion sensor. In the middle we have the piezoelectric element which will beep and on the top we have the infrared range sensor. And inside we have the microcontroller, the battery and as you can see it's already the, the blue LED, the blue light which you see means that the motion has been detected by the peer motion sensor. And now whenever the cat is coming and put it in a ball here the peer range detector will, will see it and you can hear the beeping noise. Most of it is in the ultrasound, but I've still left a small beep to be sure that we can hear something. And if the cat opens the fridge, then we have an alarm. I've put here, I've put a small switch to detect when the fridge is open or closed. And until the fridge is closed, the alarm will beep. And now it's off. And I hope with that, the cat will stop opening my fridge. <laughs>